On today's World Inside, goalposts and milestones in China's modernization. Here in a forum, eyewitness accounts of how far the nation has gone with social infrastructure and tech advances. Hello, I'm Tian Wei and welcome to World Insight. The second China Media Group Forum is being held in Shanghai this week. In the forum, China will once again come under the world spotlight. As China strides toward comprehensive modernization, the country is prioritizing high-quality growth. China's top policymakers are focusing on this growth as China's economy enters into a new phase. In the sub-forum themed the high-quality development of Chinese modernization, our panelists will elaborate on issues such as the balance between the speed and quality of development and many others. Let's take a look. Housing, the continued. How much will China? Very exciting. Ecological support line. Development. Just a dozen. I'm joined in Singapore, Bert Hoffman, director of the East Asian Institute, National University of Singapore, and also Jeffrey Sachs in Istanbul, professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. Good to see you, professor. In New Delhi, Swaran Singh, professor of uh, Jawaharlal uh, Nehru University. And in Beijing, Professor Fu Jun, academic dean of the Institute for South-South Cooperation and Development from Peking University. Professor Liu Baocheng in Beijing, dean of the Center for International Business Ethics from the University of International Business and Economics. Also, Hong Hao, chief economist at the Grow Investment Group. He's now based uh, today in Jinan. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to see all of you. Today we are working on a grand topic as to China's modernization. Now, I'm sure when it's being translated into specifics, you all have your own stories to tell. Let me start by talking to Professor Sachs. Uh, Professor, you have been traveling to China many times. You go to many places in this country. Tell me more about what exactly is China's modernization. What you saw there would help us to understand what exactly it is. Thank you very much. I was lucky to watch the modernization uh, close up uh, because I first visited China in 1981, which was just the start of the uh, fast growth period. We didn't know it then. Uh, and of course, I've come many times a year, most years ever since then. So from 1981 until today, I watched. Uh, in the uh, early 2000s, I was asked by the government officials also to look at the challenges of Western China. So, so I saw this firsthand. What I saw was a country that went from poverty to prosperity, poverty to wealth uh, in this 40 years. It is a most amazing story. Uh, it's a most amazing accomplishment. It is, I believe, also the guideposts for what will help Africa in its mm -hmm. next 40 year journey to accomplish uh, uh, a similar task, which is ending extreme poverty. Well, look, my, my, my personal story is really uh, the first time I went to China, I'm a little younger than Professor Sachs, but that was uh, 1992. And I was a macroeconomist, but the social people said, no, you got to see poverty. So uh, I went to Guangxi province to a village, and it took me two and a half days to get there from Beijing. And it was indeed a very poor village, and it was part of a, a program that the World Bank was financing. Uh, on my last year in China, 2019, I went back to that village. And I was actually not coming from Beijing, but I went back to Beijing from that village. And it took me six hours to get back to Beijing because there was a wonderful rural road, there was a highway, and then there was a direct flight to Beijing. And so the, the infrastructure development, but which, which really triggered a lot of wealth for the people in the rural areas, 
has been absolutely essential. And, and I think that the World Bank has been a, a small part of that. And I think uh, I agree with the comments that uh, the material transformation uh, is almost like miraculous. And I've had primarily been visiting to various universities and I've seen the transformation of universities, infrastructure, new campuses. And I think what is important is I have seen a complete transformation in the confidence uh, of uh, Chinese, uh, especially my colleagues uh, in various universities. And in that sense, I think this is it's something that every day one experiences how now, of course, China is completely connected to every nook and corner of China with the rapid trains. The other three gentlemen, you are based mainly in China or Hong Kong of China. So tell me more as to how do you see, well, you are in the middle of this story, the transformation of Chinese modernization. Professor Liu, briefly. Uh, yes, the, actually, I came to uh, the university in 1981, the same time the uh, Jeffrey has visited China, and uh, I really noticed the growth of my university. At that time, we only had uh, uh, 800 students, but right now we have 16,000, and uh, in terms of the international population, we already have uh, 4,000 uh, international students study on the campus. I really feel proud to be part of the process mm. and also the contributor to the Chinese opening by uh, in, uh, engaging in theoretical proposition and uh, pushing forward uh, <coughs> with my bid uh, to join WTO, etc. Mm. But having all the uh, wonderful achievements, I should uh, say that uh, we should not really ignore the challenges we are facing because previously, uh, it was easy because as long as you deregulate, as long as you give people the right type of freedom to grow what they like and to sell what uh, what really they grow, and uh, then people are motivated to it. But right now, the challenge lies at how do we deal with more uncertainties? How do we address the multiple uh, elements that right. are intertwined so that we can really move forward with more complication and with more sustainable development? personally experience uh, the fast development and fast growth phase uh, of, uh, of China. Uh, I think, you know, when I first uh, come back from overseas from my postgraduate study, uh, I joined CICC, one of the preeminent uh, Chinese investment banks uh, in China. And back then, you know, CICC only had like 2,000 people and I was, you know, one of the more senior uh, people on board. And I think, you know, besides that, you know, many other Chinese brokers uh, are, are growing very fast as well. And if you look at the domestic market, uh, uh, the uh, major league table uh, is being taken mostly by the Chinese brokers. Uh, so I think, you know, by now, uh, China has grown to a stage where it can, it has, it has more than enough uh, uh, prepare uh, to open up the domestic financial markets. So ever since, I think, less than two years ago, uh, ch uh, the Chinese uh, government formally opened the domestic market uh, for foreign entries. Mm. And now we, we're seeing uh, uh, foreign brokers, foreign investment banks operating and competing uh, uh, in China as well. Mm. And what do you see is the right way to carry on the quality opening up in a way? Yeah, I think this year, as, well, since uh, late last year, we're seeing uh, uh, foreign firms can operate uh, independently and also wholly owned uh, investment banks, brokers, and fund management houses uh, in China. So ever since then, you know, we're seeing a, a rapid uh, growth in, the, in terms of the number of foreign entities uh, operating in the uh, Chinese financial market. And I think, you know, going forward, you know, one should, you know, one should be expecting uh, even more uh, growing numbers of uh, foreign investment banks coming yeah. to the Chinese market. Mm. I still remember when I was young, that was in the 1970s, the Chinese, uh, the diet was uh, 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 low on meat and the seafood. We eat a lot of veggies. Life was very poor at the time in China. And now we uh, look at the numbers uh, before reforms uh, and opening up of China so that China become part of uh, uh, the global economy. GDP per capita here in China was 150 mm. or 56 US dollars. Mm. Now we have a climb up to 12,000. And when you look at the diet, the dramatic changes for diet, if 
that only reflects the material dimension of uh, modernization. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can talk about the intellectual and institutional dimension of modernization. That is uh, quite a reflection of uh, how far yeah. and uh, how much we have accomplished in the past 40 or so. What is high quality growth to you? You know, how are we going to link the uh, Chinese modernization and high quality growth, both of which are quite abstract terms with what exactly is going on? Which area are you looking at mo most closely? Uh, Professor Sachs, let's start from you once again. I think that there are uh, three big challenges right now in the world uh, in which China is right at the center. The first is the ecological challenge. Uh, we know that we have to have a, a different kind of energy system, a different kind of industry, because uh, the kind that we have based on fossil fuels has led us to really the precipice of extreme, extreme environmental damage and danger. So transformation is number one. The second big issue is China, through the Belt and Road Initiative, has recognized quite deeply, and also through the Global Development Initiative recently, uh, that China's uh, future is inextricably linked with development throughout the world. This is right. Uh, China will be a major exporter to the developing countries. China will be a major provider of financing for those countries. China will be a major builder of the infrastructure throughout the world. So this is the second big challenge. And the third big challenge is, unfortunately, China's success triggered an adverse reaction in the United States. I think a completely wrong-headed and dangerous one. But uh, American strategists have come to see China as a threat to American primacy. Oh, well, I, I tell them, so what? This is not a matter of primacy. This is a matter of global well-being and global cooperation. Mm -hmm. Stop thinking in win-lose terms. But unfortunately, this relationship is now fraught with problems. And it is really important that the U.S. and China find a path to cooperation. Uh, I think the uh, Chinese growth has been quite energy intensive. So I think it's... Uh, uh, Professor Sachs just said uh, uh, now, you know, it has to be, you know, high quality growth has to be uh, environmental friendly and energy efficient as well. And I think, you know, China has, has passed uh, the stage, you know, where easy growth can be easily had. And, you know, it, you know, we have make the pie uh, grow so big that now, you know, it, it's also a question of how better to divide this pie uh, between our people. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I think uh, two years ago, you know, we, um, uh, we propose a concept of inclusive growth. So meaning that, you know, we're letting more people share the fruits of economic development uh, more fairly. Uh, so I think going forward, you know, there has to be a sort of a, a social system reform, you know, in the sense that, you know, we rebuild our social welfare system, healthcare system, uh, our retirement system, system, et cetera, et cetera, so, so that, you know, our people can sort of enjoy uh, better, you know, the uh, the fruits from uh, economic development. So I think that would be like one of the uh, main objective going forward. And and I think besides that, you know, uh, having more energy efficient growth uh, mm -hmm. and also getting used to the phase of slower growth, slower economic growth, and, and at the same time, you know, uh, trying to uh, distribute income and wealth uh, sort of on a more uh, e equal base across the board. You know, I think that would be beneficiary to the Chinese uh, economy going forward. Mm. Well, I, I, I don't disagree with any of that, but I do think that there's additional challenges that China needs to face. Uh, China's at $12,000 per capita, which is wonderful. It's 100 times what it was uh, in 1978. But if you look at the average OECD country, it's at 45,000. The United States is at over 50,000. Singapore, where I live, is at 70,000. So if you want to, to become a, a prosperous, a real prosperous country in an all-around matter, there's still a lot to grow. And that growth will have to come from a more efficient growth, a more innovative growth, uh, a more uh, technology-driven growth, but also more, if you want, a more market-based growth. Housing, the 
continues. How much will China? Very exciting. Ecological support or line? Development. Just a dozen. Uh, how do you see China is coming up with the right solution? In fact, how much is it linked, what Professor Hoffman and some of the others just illustrated, to the economic growth rate and also the potential of growth in the near term? Is it possible? Well, uh, we put a very strong proposal which seems to be very right in uh, having an effective government and also efficient market. But uh, the, uh, how we can really combine the effectiveness and efficiency uh, on both hands, uh, we do not really have a very clear line. So therefore, it leaves a large room for free inter uh, interpretation, uh, particularly at the local government level, then uh, when they are too uh, aggressive and assertive into the market, they say, okay, this is really effective uh, government. And uh, when some governments are lazy and do not really perform their job, they say, okay, we leave the efficient market first. So therefore, we do need a clear uh, borderline between uh, you know, the role of uh, the uh, government versus the, uh, the market. Secondly, is you know, when we really go for high quality growth, it is really the high quality people that are, re are really required. They are both the means and end for social and economic development. So right now, yes, we have uh, <clears throat> over 10,000 uh, graduates from universities on a yearly basis, but do they really have the right type of quality of professional skills that can really meet the demand for high quality growth? If we can see that uh, over the uh, past two years of export uh, mm -hmm. composition, much of that is still labor intensive. So therefore, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, dream is one thing, but reality is another. Lastly, I think the key lies in how do we treat private sectors, including uh, you know, the Chinese uh, private uh, firms and also foreign firms here. So if they are not really placed on the equal footing for, co for competition, there's no way that we can really see a accelerated growth for the Chinese economy and also for Chinese sustainable development. Professor Sachs. Yes, uh, I think the, uh, the question uh, is, first of all, to move beyond the conventional measurements. So uh, I would like to know about uh, the clean air, the low carbon, the uh, longevity of healthy lives, and so forth. I think that this is what the common prosperity idea uh, in China is really about. And I think for all our economies, we're going to have to get past uh, some of our hangups with the current measurements, which have led us to a very dirty, uh, rather unequal uh, and uh, not so happy uh, quality of life. Let me just point out that in the United States, we get richer and richer and life expectancy continues to decline now. Uh, we're back to life expectancy of 25 years ago. This is dreadful. The population is sick. It's being poisoned by bad diets. Uh, it's, it's not being measured properly. So I would like to see all of our economies, but I, since China is so good at this, about thinking at its fut about the future, to think about what really matters for the quality of life, mm -hmm. for the distribution of the goods and services uh, that we need yeah. for the protection of the environment. But also, I think it's inevitable China's so big and so influential in the world that China is going to be a leader globally of this new direction. That's a good thing. I think the Belt and Road Initiative, in my personal view, should be expanded. I know there's some skepticism, but it's a, it's a terrific initiative, and it should actually be expanded because we need to build out a high quality of life infrastructure for the 21st century. And I think the Belt and Road Initiative can really help to do that. Mm -hmm. Professor Fu, is it possible for developing countries, emerging economies, to be able to not only increase you know, the growth rate of the economy, but also to really see the quality can be of higher quality as China aspires to do? How much will China succeed or fails to succeed having an impact on the rest of the developing world, the global south, which you have been 
working on for years? Well, still, uh, let me go back to the three uh, dimensions of the framework, the analytical framework that I use, at least in my class, to look at uh, the catching up process. One is the material dimension of the framework. Uh, the other is the institution. And the deep still is uh, uh, the framework of ideas. Ultimately, for mm. us to have a sustained uh, development is the human ideas. Then we must have better organizations to coordinate human behavior and what we see is the last thing is the physicality of modernization and it all boils down to the creative mind of a human idea so that uh, we reduce yeah. the contradiction between the material dimension and the, the human uh values if you may uh that we care about the creative mind we also care about our health and professor singh maybe you can provide us with more uh, vibrant examples or uh, reference uh, from where you are in India, certainly one of the also aspiring uh, emerging economies. Uh, so I would look at China's uh, modernization from the perspective of large population country and continuing ancient civilization. In history in universities across the world, modern history begins with the Renaissance in Europe, mercantilism, industrial revolution, colonization, small European states colonized large nations around the world. Uh -huh. And most of the post-colonial states for a long time continue to understand modernization as westernization. And I think that is the distinction that Jeffrey Sachs uh, tried to bring about, I think is something we need to underline. The fact that China is 1.4 billion people is a miracle that China has produced 800 million people that is a population larger than whole of Europe put together, has been brought out of uh, poverty uh, by Chinese. Uh, a, a economy from 300 billion in 1990 to 18 trillion. And that is the miracle to me. I think that is the change and that is what is visible in the everyday street, you know, people walking on street in, in Chinese cities with greater confidence. And that miracle, of course, has brought its own challenges. And I think we need to underline those challenges here. Such a rapid miracle has produced very rapid growth rate, but also issues of environment, issues of social values, issues of declining marriage rates and increasing divorce rates, uh, workforce shrinking, aging population. And of course, we remember China is a socialist state that still believes in Marxism and the increasing you know, difference of uh, income levels of people. Shanghai versus uh, Shanghai, for example, those are newer challenges that, of course, are a result of such a rapid progress that China has made, but that in no way should undermine the fact that China has achieved unusually unprecedented uh, growth. And it's like bringing the whole Europe together upwards. China's population is larger than all of the developed world put together. So even if they are still at $12,000 uh, you know, per year, it, it is the average man's life that has changed in China. To me, as an Indian, that is what is significant. Of course, newer challenges are there, and China will have to deal with that. And that is why you see now the leadership in China is beginning to talk of not just material growth rates, but also cultural, spiritual, yeah. ethical development of China. And I think that is a natural understanding that has come about because of the yeah. continuing ancient civilization that China has had and the traditions and customs that have been there, the wisdom that has been there. Now, I go to Professor Sachs for some wisdom. One of the reasons why this is so complicated is that we are at the end of the Western-led world economy. So we're really into something new, and that's also what Professor Singh was emphasizing. For 250 years, all the yardsticks came from Britain or the United States or the so-called Western world. That was always a historical anomaly because for almost all of human history it's been india and china uh, and asia that was the pace setter for europe not the other way around and now we're in a in a very exciting world i think uh, dangerous yes but exciting in that we are no longer in a uh, western-led world we're in a multipolar world and I was very happy to hear uh, Professor Singh talk about uh, this reaching for uh, the cultural base 
of well-being in different civilizations because we're really seeing a lot of that discussion emerging. Of course, China has uh, announced, uh, and I think it's very exciting, a global civilizations initiative. And uh, President Xi has spoken about the need to uh, uh, look to uh, the, the cultural history of China itself for China's strength. And I'm seeing that in, in India, of course, and other parts of the world. Now, put that together with the environmental challenges, with the inequalities, uh, with the rapid uh, changes of technology, especially the digital technologies, we're in a period of disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to keep everything peaceful. This is the most important fact. The West, is, the United States, not such a peaceful country, unfortunately. It has to learn to be more peaceful, which is something that really is urgent right now. But we're in a period of change, and China's just going to play a huge role in that. And asking for a clear prediction can't be done in the same way as, say, 40 years ago it was catching up. This is not about catching up anymore. This is about figuring out a way to live well in the 21st century. Yeah, indeed. About this change, I'm sure Professor Hoffman also has something to say. Well, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I agree with all of uh, what Professor Singh and, and Professor Sachs say, that <clears throat> development is more than just GDP. I'm not, I'm not arguing that it's just GDP, but I do think that it opens up choices. I think China has some really hard choices to make, and that is in the area of distribution, i.e. the common prosperity. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic concept. Uh, but it also means that, that there has to be policy tools to actually make that happen. And, and there is still quite a bit of divide in China that would need to be addressed in order to make more common prosperity. And it's between the young and the old, between the urban and the rural, mm. between, between the coastal and the inland. So there's, there's lots of, and, and that, that won't go away unless there is quite significant policy action. Uh, the, the second part uh, on on the uh, ecological civilization, which is a wonderful concept. Uh, again, the, the the tools, the policy tools are there, but they also need to be put in place. And and we are running out of time, so it is no longer optional. That it is both in the West as well as in China and in other countries, uh, there would need to be action. How do you see this vitality in the society, and how they are relevant? to the real picture of China and the hope of China. Yeah, I think um, this is a, a very big part, a big part of China. Uh, so, you know, 70% of the uh, Chinese employment is provided by SMEs, uh, small and, and medium sized uh, business. And also, you know, after three years of pandemic, I think, you know, many of the small smaller businesses are ha having a tough time, uh, you know, dealing with uh, weakening demand uh, and also, you know, uh, uh, credit expansion that is slowing as well. So I think, you know, um, um, the, the government is uh, rolling out policies trying to help them because after all, you know, we're dealing with 70% of the uh, Chinese uh, employment and also 80% of the Chinese GDP growth coming from, you know, these SMEs. Uh, so they are a particularly important part uh, for China uh, and also a particular crucial part, you know, to have uh, uh, assistance policy to help yeah. them uh, uh, sort of uh, get through this uh, uh, tough environment. Mm. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us on this uh, rather concise, uh, uh, abstract uh, discussion. I hope uh, we're going to explore many of the topics that you all mentioned uh, during the discussion in the near future. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Inside. Check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tianwei. On behalf of the team, thanks for joining us. Bye.